Hi everyone, I'm Mary Ellen with Headwaters Science Institute and welcome to our Lunch with the Scientist. Today we have Will Boyer, he is a hydrologist originally from Nevada, which fostered his love for the desert. He studied, oh, well, Will, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing great, Mary, thanks for, thanks for asking. I was so focused on introducing you, I realized you were there. Um, he is from Nevada and he has, he's did his first studies with geological engineering at Colorado School of Mines. And then he went on to UNR to get a master's in hydrology. Right now, Will works for the Nevada Division of Water Resources, studying groundwater and evapotranspiration. And so he's here with us today, hopefully to share some of his studies and uh, maybe share what his favorite plant is in the desert. <laughs> so, Will, are you ready to uh, turn it over? Oh, I'm fired up. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah. Just talk about water resources in Nevada is one of my favorite topics. So really excited to be here. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit of my work and interests and sort of what my scientific process looks like. Uh, yeah, let's get to it. Um, before we get to that, Will, I have one uh, big thank you to put out there. Um, I, we would like to thank the WN Toscano Agency in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. They've been a longtime supporter of Headwaters, and uh, we appreciate their support so that we can offer these science talks free online. Uh, they take pride in offering great customer service, uh, making a wonderful place for employees to work, and more importantly, giving back to the community. Uh, if anybody listening is a fan of science and would like to help us keep these going, please reach out to us. So on to you, Will. Take it away. Okay. Um, yeah. Can't wait. So let's see. i got to make sure I keep everything straight here because I've got a lot of exciting things to talk about today. Um, as Marilyn mentioned, I am a hydrologist who lives in Nevada. I live in Reno. It's a kind of an interesting place, that's for sure, especially lately, as I'm sure it's, you know, the world has been for everyone. Um, Nevada is one of the driest states in the nation. We'll talk a little more about that. So of course, water is a really challenging resource to manage for our state. Um, this first slide that I've got pulled up a little bit is, I just wanna show you guys a little bit of the, I don't know how familiar everyone is with what our desert looks like. I know probably a lot of people listening in are from California or that kind of thing. So over here in the desert is a little bit of a foreign world. Um, our state basically consists of about 230 valleys that all have their own sort of water systems, which is a lot different than you might get in California with the Central Valley and the Sierras and kind of more or less one very large system. So our state's a lot more segregated and you get this kind of typical um, big flat valley where the water collects at the bottom, uh, you've got different mountains that feed into all of them. And it's a very interesting and separated state. This is what's called a, a playa, um, or basically like a big dry lake bed. And I wanted to start my talk with a question for all of you guys, um, which is how many playas do you think are in the state of Nevada? Uh, a lot of these valleys have playas at the bottom. Um, people are probably most familiar with like the Black Rock Desert, which is largest playa in our state. It uh, is host to the Festival of Burning Man. Um, and these playas can sometimes be wet at times of the year, sometimes dry, but they're a very interesting feature that's pretty unique to our state. Um, there's a few others in desert states across the West, but we seem to have the most of them. So I just wanted to go ahead and ask that question. And if anyone has an idea or wants to hazard a guess, uh, go ahead and type that into the comments box and I will try my best to satisfy your answers to this question in a little while. This is the Smith Creek Valley Playa actually a couple of weeks ago. And as you can see it, had water on it at the time, which surprised us. Most of the time these are dry year round and it consists of really hard packed surface that you can just drive right across a really interesting feature. Um, anyways though, getting into water resources in the state of Nevada, um, I think I mentioned we're the driest state in the United States. So if you look at the map here, I've got of 30 year precipitation averages for the United States. You can see there's not a lot of blues, greens, purples showing up uh, for Nevada, really just red and dark red, which if you look at the 
little color code here that's looking pretty bad, like four inches of precipitation. Uh, Nevada is what you consider arid land state, um, which means it would get less than 15 inches of precipitation annually. Um, arid lands are any place that receives less than 15 inches and needs uh, a water resource like irrigation or some sort of water from outside to irrigate the lands or make them arable. So parts of the Central Valley you'll notice are also what we consider arid lands. Um, on average, Nevada as a whole gets about seven and a half inches of precipitation. Uh, contrastingly, California gets as much as 100 inches of precipitation in places like up in the North Coast. And you'll notice on the map kind of, you know, the Sierras, which are really the main water providing feature of California, kind of the lifesaver for that. That's The Sierras are also the reason that Nevada is so dry. A lot of the storms kind of move from the west to the east coming off the coast and they hit the Sierras, which basically just create a big barrier and they starve our state of all the moisture and precipitation it needs. Um, one of the other places in the United States is a little bit drier is kind of that southern desert out in the Mojave um, and the Sonora Desert. As you can see, there's actually seems according to this map to get less precipitation. Um, and those are really the driest place in the United States. But because that's sort of the southern part of California, there's not a lot of population or irrigation out in the Mojave Desert. It's really hot. Um, we're usually not as concerned about water resources as we are, for instance, for Nevada as a whole. Um, the other interesting thing I like about this map, you guys notice the kind of divide in precipitation that happens once you get to the east side of the country. On that part of the country, they don't even understand the idea of like water resource management or irrigating their lands. You know, they don't have the same kind of irrigation systems. They do have dams and obviously they need to make sure that they're supplying water to the people and farms as they need them. But it rains a lot more continuously on the East Coast and kind of can rain year round. Um, and they just kind of, it's not as dry. They really, you know, you notice this divide so they don't have the same sort of issues that we do over here in the West. Um, another really interesting thing that about California and Nevada water resources is the variability that we get on a sort of year to year basis. And, you know, you guys can recognize this just by thinking about what happened this winter versus what happened last winter. Um, you know, last winter was a really, really big water year. Uh, you know, it snowed pretty much nonstop throughout the winter. It was really cold. We ended up with somewhere around 150% of average precipitation. This year, we got about half of that amount of precipitation. Um, and then, you know, in 2017, of course, we had a record water year, uh, literally the record that has ever been recorded for the Sierras and for a lot of Nevada and California. But that was coming off of four years of the worst drought that we've also ever recorded. And so what this coefficient of variation graph means is that basically the water, the amount of water is not consistent from a year to year basis, um, which, means that it's really, really important to have good systems for water resource management, good dams to collect that water so that if you have a good year, you have water. And then the next year, if you have a dry year, well, you still have water in the dam that can then provide a resource for agriculture or for the cities or that kind of stuff. And that is a bit more of a problem in Nevada where we don't have as much surface water. We'll get into that a little bit more. The other thing you'll notice from this um, variation map is that there's not a lot of points out in Nevada uh, it's a really, really not unpopulated state, especially out in central and eastern Nevada. Our population density is really low out there. There's not a lot of agriculture just because there's not a lot of water. And so correspondingly, there's actually not a lot of recorded scientific data on that part of the state, which makes a lot of uh, my work and other people's work with water management and scientific studies a little bit more difficult. We'll touch on that a little bit more later. Also, another reason that we need a lot of water resources in both California and Nevada, a lot of good management practices. The, another reason we need good systems and infrastructure is because we get really, really seasonal precipitation patterns out here. Um, if you guys are familiar with the water cycle in California or the typical you know, yearly sort of idea, we get these big storms in the winter. We get something called atmospheric rivers a lot. We get a lot of snow in the winter and we really build up a big snowpack. And then during the summer, you know, that's when we go into that fire season. It's really dry. We get really bad fire weather when it hasn't rained for, you know, two, three months at a time, which is actually pretty common for the summers around here, both in California and Nevada. So again, we need those resources to figure out how to collect the water and store it and then use it when we need it during the summer. So during the winter, we collect, groundwater fills up in the summer, we take that water. It's kind of like give and take and, you know, things like droughts can really exacerbate that. 
this is um, the East Humboldt Range. It's actually one of my favorite mountain ranges in Nevada. You guys see this nice little sagebrush step kind of ecosystem going on. All these plants are just sagebrush. It's very much like a sort of single community of plants across a lot of the state. Sagebrush is actually our most common plant in the state. And as Mary Ellen touched on, uh, I am gonna talk a lot about it because it's actually my favorite plant uh, as a lifelong Nevada and living in the sagebrush state, I guess that'd be expected. But hope you guys like looking at this plant because there's gonna be uh, quite a few more slides with it. So who manages water in the West? Well, there's a ton of different entities that deal with water and they use a lot of good scientific data, climate data that kind of plays into it also. Um, data about geology, all these big data sets to describe the natural resources of the West go into it. And all of these different agencies play a part in both generating that data and using it and making decisions on it. Uh, the state agencies, like for us, the Division of Water Resources, which is who I work for. Uh, in California, you have the Department of Water Resources, which is basically the same agency, although they're a department as opposed to division. I'm not sure what the exact distinction would be. Um, some other federal agencies like the Bureau of Reclamation, they deal with farms and agriculture. Uh, you have the Army Corps of Engineers who deals with dams and dam safety and how much water you can store and when. The United States Geological Survey deals with a lot of scientific issues regarding water flow and plant water uptake and interactions and actual more science behind water. The Environmental Protection Agency, of course, they deal with water quality and making sure you have a healthy ecosystem. Fish and Wildlife Service, they want water for plants, fish, you name it, or sorry, animals, fish, um, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, the National Park Service, they all have water resources that exist on their land, so then they want to inventory and manage that resource. And then you even have organizations like the Federal Emergency Management Agency, right? They're dealing with water because they wanna make sure that if there's a big flood, that there's not an emergency related to it. Or, you know, if you have a big drought, well, that's also kind of a natural disaster. It's just slow moving. And, you know, that's something that they might have to deal with if it gets bad enough. And then, Related to all those even more, of course, you have municipal water suppliers supplying water for your towns, for uh, private water breweries providing water for people or agricultural systems and hydropower companies. And the list goes on and on and on with who deals with water and who manages it. I mean, water is literally the most important resource on earth. We humans need water more than anything else. And so as you might expect, there's a number of related processes, procedures, and people who are dealing with all of those things to ensure that our water supply exists for all those uses. And as I touched on, I work for the Nevada Division of Water Resources. Um, I'm actually relatively new there uh, with this whole coronavirus thing. At this point, I've almost been working from my home as much as I have in the office. But the Division of Water Resources, our mission is to conserve, protect, manage, and enhance the state's water resources for Nevada citizens through the appropriation and reallocation of public waters. And what does that mean? It basically means that we're recognizing where and how much water exists in the state to be used, and we're trying to determine who can use it in the most fair way and in what way they can use it that's most beneficial to the state as a whole. And you know, we're kind of regulating and managing and how do I say, coming up with a way to work that resource in a way that's fair for all of its citizens to have a system to utilize. And there's, a, there's another aspect of the Division of Water Resources, which is to protect citizens from water related hazards. So floods, infrastructure failure, like a, a dam failing, and also droughts. Um, and this is, a, these are both, these are all smaller components of the division. Uh, you know, we're the driest state in the nation, so you don't have a lot of floods or infrastructure failure kind of issues, but we still want to make sure that for those issues that we have, we're able to take care of. Um, but as a new person at the Division of Water Resources, I don't really want to talk about that organization or that agency too much. Um, I don't think it's necessarily my duty to be a spokesperson, but I do want to go into this talk a little more and talk about sort of my learning process and how I've been applying science to my role, which I am considered a water planner, and I deal a lot with drought management and water planning and decision-making and policy to facilitate those kind of things. And so the way that the Division of Water Resources uses science, um, it's kind of this flowchart process. Scientists typically are the first part of the process. They come up with data. They tell us how our natural resources work. As a scientist, you figure out what processes in the natural world exist and how are those creating the resources that we need or how are we able to use them? 
So scientists create the data, the decision makers look at the scientific information and we say, well, if this is the way the natural world works, then this is the way humans should use those processes and this is the way we should interact with them. And then we come up with policy that people have to be compliant to. Um, and you know, we say, hey, we want you to use this much water or we have these water laws or this is the way a water right might work. Um, and we come up with a way to use that science in a system that works for people. And it really is a, a feedback loop. You know, if you come up with policy, then you might get data out of it. Say you come up with a policy that says every user of water needs to have a meter to register how much water they're using. Well, all of a sudden you have a huge data set that tells you that and scientists could use that. Um, the other way that there's a feedback loop here, and this is kind of a lot of the process that I've been dealing with, I'm kind of in this decision-making realm. Um, you have a question or issue that needs to be solved. You say, well, we don't have enough of this water resource, or we're curious about, can we use more or if we enact a policy? Well, then you throw that idea back to a scientist and they're able to look at it. And so, yeah, most of the division water resource professionals are kind of in the range of decision makers and policy. You know, we're more of like a legal and regulatory organization. Um, and my role personally as a water planner falls somewhere in this, in between the realm of science and decision making. And what I'm going to talk about further in the talk is sort of a question, some questions that I've had thinking about how to make decisions and plan better. And these scientific issues are really fundamental to the way that Nevada has been managing its water resources. And we need to make sure that that's a valid way of thinking about the natural world to continue using that as our fundamental processes. So I was formally trained as a hydrologist, as Mary Ellen mentioned. Um, and I, these are kind of my joke slides. So what I dreamed being a hydrologist might look like, you know, going to interesting places to look at crystal blue waters, analyzing humongous sagebrush and trying to figure out, doing a lot of field work, get some guys out on a lake, thinking about water quality. And well, since I've been a professional out of grad school, this is what it more often looks like. Uh, a lot of data, a lot of data to look through, which is, which is good. That's the way you deal with large issues of natural resources. Um, you get big data sets and you figure out trends across the earth and how they're all working. And of course, drinking coffee. I mean, who doesn't like to do that? So what is the actual role of a hydrologist? I wanna start by talking about this a little bit because that's sort of the scientific equivalent of all these water resource roles is a hydrologist in its purest form. And a hydrologist is somebody who researches the distribution, circulation, physical properties of water, uh, it's really actually a vague scientific term because it just means somebody who does something that's scientifically related to water. Uh, there's a lot of offshoots that are engineering related, that are specifically ecology related, that uh, relate to e uh, resource management and geology. And then of course, water quality, you know, you could consider a hydrologist somebody who's looking at the water quality in your pipes and determining if it's if it, you know, good enough for you to drink. Um, I've got a picture of this guy, this is Henry Darcy. He was, he's kind of credited as being the world's first hydrologist in some ways, or at least probably it's most famous. Um, he was French and he was actually an engineer, but he had a bunch of issues that he needed to solve regarding uh, the water system for his city in France that he lived in. And there weren't really any equations or hydrologic ideas for figuring out how to create a good filtration system. In this case, they were using what's called a sand filter. So he needed some different equations and methodology to actually characterize how water flows through different porous mediums. Um, so sand or rock or you know any sort of soil. And he created an equation called Darcy's Law and then he began to do a bunch of scientific experiments regarding the actual flow of water and he transitioned from an engineer into the world's first hydrologist, Henry Darcy. And so I'm gonna go rapid fire just through a few of the types of hydrologists um, that exist. Because depending on who you talk to, there's uh, as many as like 100 specializations of the science. Um, and people work in all sorts of different fields. But I'm gonna just talk about a few of them. Uh, and you get the idea once I start to describe them that, you know, if it involves water and there's some study to be done scientifically, then you could call that a type of hydrology. Uh, so this guy's surface water hydrologist right here. He's probably doing some sort of study of the actual character of this water in the stream, maybe he's doing 
uh, water quality testing, or it kind of looks like he's maybe got some sort of instrument for like transmissivity or temperature. So he's measuring the qualities of water. So surface water hydrologist, of course, studies water flowing or collecting at the surface of the earth. The counterpart to that is a groundwater hydrologist, which is somebody who studies water flowing and collecting underground. Um, we're going to talk a lot about this later in the talk because that's predominantly what Nevada's water resources look like or groundwater resources. Uh, how about an eco-hydrologist or eco-hydrology? That's somebody who studies the interactions between water and ecological systems. Uh, maybe this woman's looking at water properties and how it interacts with this grassland, or maybe there's some sort of unique frog species that lives in there or something, I'm not sure. Um, another type of hydrology might be flood hydrology. This is a really pragmatic study because um, you don't want a big flood to come and wipe out your town. You you want to know how big is that flood going to be? How likely is it to occur? How fast might it move if you all of a sudden realize there's a huge storm system that's creating this flood? So a flood hydrologist, a flood hydrologist might study the causes, impacts, dynamics of floods, what it might do to a water supply, what it might do to water quality. How about snow hydrology? That's obviously the study of snow, which is, of course, another water resource. Studying how it might interact with some of these factors like um, solar radiation and how a snowpack might develop, you know, maybe under trees or out in a meadow or how a snowpack might melt in different places. Hydrogeology. I know, I know you guys are thinking, wait a minute, you already talked about groundwater hydrology. Well, hydrogeology is different in that it's sort of a way of looking at the study of hydrology, but from a geologist's perspective. So it's not so much what is the water doing underground as much as how is the geology influencing what the water is doing underground. That's just yet another facet of the science. Finally, the final type of hydrology that I want to talk about is arid land hydrology or drought hydrology. And these are the study of water resources and shortages of water in deserts. I think they're very closely linked. And for us in Nevada, uh, this is basically what it means to be a water resource manager. You are studying arid land hydrology constantly. It's really a heavily database science. You want to look at long-term trends in different factors like precipitation and vegetation cover and groundwater levels. And we'll get into all of that in a little bit. Um, so what does the water cycle look like? I know a lot of you guys are probably familiar with this idea of the water cycle. Um, it's a pretty basic concept. This is what the water cycle might look like for on a global scale or in most places. Um, and this is where you get all of those different aspects of hydrologic sciences that are purely natural sciences, no relation to how humans are using the water. Um, you know, in a typical system, the water cycle basically consists of evaporation, pulling your water up, of course, into clouds where you get condensation, precipitation up in the mountains or any place where it might rain, and then that's going to go into rivers or lakes and also infiltrate into the groundwater where you're going to get discharge from the groundwater at different springs and lakes, and then maybe eventually flowing to the ocean you get a big aquifer where the groundwater is storing. Um, snow melt's going to run off into the streams. You get runoff over the surface of the land and rivers, creeks. And then you get some other factors like transpiration. That's basically the evaporation that's caused by plants. Or, you know, plants are doing what's called transpiring. They're uptaking water and they're pulling it out into the atmosphere and distributing it. So that's another loss of water. Um, sublimation, that's loss of water due to snow as, you know, it's basically not melting. It's actually just doing what's called sublimating. So it's going from solid to gas phase. Um, and then there's something called interception, which is when your water falls on a plant or maybe on their surface, instead of it soaking in or becoming groundwater surface runoff, you know, there's things that it's landing on are going to be warm or maybe contribute to evaporation. So interception is just that water being pulled immediately. And so you can imagine all of these different parts of the water cycle have different avenues to be studied and explored so that decision makers and people who want to do engineering projects based off water, you know, they need to know about it. And anyone who really wants to do science is going to have lots of interesting avenues to study for that. Um, so what does our water cycle look like in Nevada? Well, it's still the same. We just don't have this idea of ocean. Uh, there's, there's no ocean component of our water cycle and we don't have as much freshwater storage and there's no recharge of the groundwater going to the ocean. Nevada's called the basin and range or the Great Basin. Um, and that's because it literally is just like a huge bowl and we don't have any real interaction with the ocean. So you have to take this water cycle, and I know this is a really ugly graphic, but basically just sort of do
duplicate it. And at the bottom, you've got your playa or your valley bottom. And the same processes will happen on both sides of the valley. And then all your water, as opposed to going to the ocean, it just sits in the valley. And so I'm going to go back to my original picture. This is the Newark Valley Playa. Um, and I know what you guys are thinking, which is, well, I just showed you a picture of the water cycle, but like, where's the actual water? And yeah, I think that's a really valid question, which the answer is that there isn't a lot of actual water. Um, you take that water cycle, you know, we're, say at different times of the year, we're gonna get our precipitation in the mountains. The interesting thing about Nevada is that most of the precipitation doesn't really go anywhere. It evaporates almost immediately. And that's due to that process that I was talking about called interception. Uh, and depending on the valley and the part of the state and the temperature, um, somewhere between, it's estimated between 70 and 95% of the precipitation just immediately evaporates and never really becomes part of the water cycle on the ground level in our state. Um, so yeah, that precipitation happens in the mountains. It kind of goes away quickly. There's in a lot of parts of the state, there's not any actual surface water flow. There's no rivers, there's no streams, but there, there are some rivers and streams in Nevada that you can be found in different places. Not, not necessarily in the Newark Valley when I took this photo. Um, and then obviously you've got this huge flat Valley surface with lots of opportunities for evaporation to happen. You know, if this lake did have water, it would be constantly subjected to wind and sun and that water would go away. And then it, you know, would look like this big dry lake, which is what it was in this photo. And then over here on the right side of the photo, you've got these plants, which are getting water from somewhere, obviously, um, but they're also discharging that water to the atmosphere. So again, where is that water? Well, I think the plants give us a clue. The water that's in this valley is gonna be groundwater. And so when that water is precipitating in the mountains, you will get some infiltration. The water will go into the ground. You know, imagine you're in your backyard watering your garden, right? It's going to soak into the ground. And then over time, it's going to actually flow underground through the mountains and down out into the valley where you get what's considered the groundwater aquifer. And a lot of these valleys have pretty extensive aquifers that are quite a ways underground where they're not really subjected to the effects of evaporation due to wind and due to heat, it's kind of cool under there. They maintain pretty reasonable levels of groundwater throughout the year. And while we're on this slide, actually, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to my first question. How many playas in Nevada? Um, and I'm curious what you guys wanted to answer here. So we have, let's see, Gavin says 217. Let's see, Rachel says 37. Okay, well, two answers. Well, guys, um, you're going to be uh, frustrated with my answer, maybe. The truth is that it's a trick question and that I don't know the answer, um, which you might say, hey, that's not fun. But that is um, the truth. Size is a really important um, consideration for this question. What makes a playa a playa. Um, I don't really know. It hasn't really been defined. Um, and if you look at this map, you'll see these are the major playas in Nevada. But here's some like other places where there's a lot of playas. Like if you look at this picture on the left, I don't know how many can you count in this photo, like 20. So do they count? I don't know. This one in this picture was one that I found that was about 100 feet long, but like 20 feet wide. I don't know if that counts. Um, but Typically, people say to be considered a major playa, it has to be at least 2,000 feet in diameter. And it's known that there's at least 100 playas that are 2,000 feet in diameter. And then these other smaller features are called micro playas, and there's literally thousands of them across the state. So sorry about the trick question. Anyways, we're going to go back to groundwater now that we've answered that. Um, I like this sort of graphic over here because it illustrates that idea of the groundwater basins in Nevada. If you see in this graphic, we've got basically like four different groundwater basins. And you notice some of them might interflow in between each other, but like this one on the far left, that's basically a closed basin. So the rock that separates it from the other basin next to it means that there's really no water flow. It's an impermeable bedrock layer, which if you guys have ever seen rain on a rock, you know, it doesn't really sink in depending on the rock type, but for most rocks, it just kind of runs off, right? And the way Nevada is topographically set up, we've got 
it's called the basin and range. So we've got these mountain ranges and then we've got a big valley, which is like your bowl of water. And then you got a mountain range and then your next bowl of water. And it's over and over and over again. And this is kind of what groundwater looks like in the state. Um, you get this idea of the basins. I like this graphics. So you can really see so the topography between ranges and then basin and then range and then basin. And then basically each one of these valleys has its own groundwater system. And while they do interact somewhat, for the most part, we manage them as if they're all not connected unless there is scientific data to suggest otherwise. And so for administrative purposes, we have 200, 232 separate groundwater basins in the state, and each one of them gets uh, managed separately to take care of its water resources. Uh, about 25% of them do share connections from river systems. Uh, I don't have these on the map, but the main river system in Nevada is the Humboldt River, which kind of flows from the Northeast, um, all the way down into the western portion of the state. And then we've got these other four rivers that are basically the only other rivers in Nevada. So five rivers in the state that connect some of these basins. And all of these basins for administrative purposes have something called a perennial yield, um, which I'm gonna go to, going to get into a little bit here. Uh, sorry about this bad graphic. It looks like it was uh, drawn by a cartoon creator. Um, the perennial yield, though, is basically we consider it the maximum amount of groundwater that can be salvaged each year over the long term without depleting a groundwater reservoir. And so here's my schematic, basically, of what you might sort of expect one of those valleys to look like in Nevada. The precipitation is going to mostly fall in the mountains. It's going to percolate into the ground. And then you're going to get an aquifer that will form in that geology of the, of the basin. Um, and it's you know going to be just literally water sitting underground in the valley. Uh, plants, of course, are going to tap into that a little bit and pull that water out. And then the perennial yield factor. Here's here's your you know guy pulling out his water. And if you have a good perennial yield estimate, then basically with a little bit of drawdown from the initial level, you'll get a stable level, which the groundwater will maintain, or at least that's the idea behind perennial yield. And so for the Division of Water Resources, we use perennial yield to determine the amount of groundwater in a basin that's available for appropriation. So how much water can be used on a yearly basis? And that generates the amount of water rights for a basin, and that generates also the pumping amounts that are associated with all those water rights and the way that they all interact. And this original perennial yield for each of the 232 groundwater basins was calculated from estimated groundwater budgets um, a long time ago, and there's not a good actual I haven't found any really good reports that are based on the original estimates, but uh, most people that I work with think that they were generated in the 1930s and 1940s. So that's a long time ago. Science has advanced a long ways since then. And we know the climate is changing a little bit. And so when I started as a division of water resources and I started thinking about managing water across the state of Nevada from the standpoint of these perennial yields, I had some questions about it. Um, you know, I started thinking about this from a scientific standpoint as a hydrologist. I thought, so for starters, how good were the initial calculations? You know, I know that the science in 1930 was a lot less advanced than it is now. So were those calculations actually accurate for starters? And then my second question is, are these perennial yields actually an effective way to manage groundwater resources? Like, does it make sense to say that every year we can pull a certain amount and it will actually maintain that level? And then, of course, my third question is, have things changed with the water budget? So climate change we know is impacting. That's definitely changed. Has evaporation and transpiration increased because of that? Yeah, maybe. Is the vegetation changed? Um, you know, we've got a lot more farms in places. Other places, maybe there's, you know, more cow populations than there were in 1930 that have been chewing on some of the grasses or something that might have once been in that valley. And these, these are just kind of the thoughts that I had. And so I want to run you guys through sort of my own scientific process related to these issues. And I don't have a lot of answers for these questions, honestly, or a really good, well thought out scientific study, because I'm still in the beginning stages of thinking about these scientific issues and understanding them myself. And a lot of them haven't even been addressed so far, kind of thinking about how we might get data and facilitate these questions being answered. So my first question was, were these initial perennial yield calculations correct? And if you guys remember, I said that we base all of our water management on these perennial yields. So here is water level data that's been recorded from a well. 
uh, groundwater level data for two different basins in the state. And you'll notice uh, this first one, the Black Mountain area, the Pernu yield is 1,300 acre feet. Usually uh, there's about 1,600 acre feet that gets pumped from that basin in a year. And you'll notice, apart from some weird data that comes in on this graph, the water level actually looks like it's basically the same, and that's pumping more water than the perennial yield. So you're saying, my first thought with that one is, oh yeah, that, like our perennial yield estimate is pretty good. Or if you look at this one, uh, Basin 161, Indian Springs Valley, uh, same thing, we're pumping about 100 acre feet more than the estimated perennial yield. And you notice that the groundwater level has actually been going up over time. So that's just really good management. That's a really healthy aquifer. So for both of these, the actual perennial yield is probably slightly more than what we might have originally estimated. But then I look at two other basins here. This is um, Basin 162, Pahrump Valley. If anyone's ever been to Pahrump, Nevada, you know there's a lot of there's a little community out there and a lot of wells for people's houses and municipal uses. Well, our stated perennial yield is about 20,000 acre feet and every year about 16,000 acre feet get pumped in that range more or less. And if you look at the groundwater levels for that basin, well, it's obviously declining quite dramatically. I mean, this shows about 50 feet of drop in that groundwater level um, since 1965. So maybe that perennial yield estimate isn't very good. And the same thing for this basin, Fish Lake Valley. Uh, in this basin, we're pumping basically the exact amount of the perennial yield, more or less on an annual basis. And again, we've seen about 50 feet of decline, and this is only since about 2005. So the answer to my first question, you know, are those perennial calculations correct? Well, there's 232 basins in the state, so there's a lot of variability, of course, but, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no. And I think, you know, maybe that means that we need to consider sort of readdressing them a little bit. So my second question, of course, are the existing perennial yields an effective way to manage groundwater resources? Well, this question is not quite as complicated. The answer is that we don't have a better way figured out right now. So it has to be an effective way to manage groundwater resources until we have come up with a good reason to do something different. Well, we're going to stick with it. And so then, of course, if we've decided that we're going to stick with the perennial yields, then that leads to my third question, which is why are the calculations bad? What's changed and how do we remedy that? So I started thinking about three water budget factors, like scientific factors that are probably the most important to a groundwater system um, to look about, look at perennial yields and start thinking about them. The first thing is uh, precipitation and meteorology. The second thing is the soil and rock character. So what is that water doing when it hits the ground? And the third factor is what do the plants look like because that's really the only other use of that groundwater other than people pulling the water out. And so I haven't really you know, gone into a lot of science with these factors yet. I'm sort of just brainstorming um, how I might be able to conduct this study or think about it more. So for the first thing, precipitation and meteorology. Um, again, here's our rainfall map of the state. You notice that you know, the mountains are where it rains, the valleys are kind of dry. And these are the kind of questions that I have that I'm thinking about for precipitation. You know, how much precipitation does a basin get? What time of year does it get precipitation? Does it fall on the valley floor? Or what is the precipitation distribution like? Does it fall as rain? That's probably going to be the case for most of southern Nevada where it's really warm. Or does it fall as snow, you know, maybe in northern Nevada where the Ruby Mountains are or up in your northeast corner, we've got some really tall, cold mountains. Yeah, it's mostly snow. Do we get a snowpack? You know, that will impact what happens with the precipitation. If there's a snowpack, then we're not gonna get water until it melts. Um, and then does that precipitation create floods or streams or are there rivers? And then have these characteristics changed and what data exists for those factors? There's some of my questions, you know, how much precipitation do we get? Okay, I might look at rain gauges, I might look at snow tell. What time of year, you know, again, I'm gonna look at climate data sets and snow tell. Does it fall on the valley floor? Well, you know, it might be hard to determine. I showed you guys a long time ago in these slides, there's not a lot of good information for Nevada, so we might not be able to have this, this sort of resolution to establish that. Um, you know, there's limited data for some of these, but the main thing we're gonna look at is snow tell, grid to climate data sets, gauges, and they're gonna answer these questions. Um, for something like climate change, you're gonna look at scientific papers, you know, so, and predictions suggest that we might get similar precipitation qualities, but less snow, of course, with warming temperatures. Um, and so the first thing I might do is look for some of that data and just see what exists to answer my question. 
before I try and generate more or suggest doing field work or doing some sort of project. So here's what some of that data might look like. This is a snow tail data set. Uh, and the picture on the left, it's actually showing you the amount of uh, current snowpack that is in each of these major watersheds. And there's a lot of other information that's associated with these snow tail sites. Um, this uh, picture on the right is just snow tail data that's produced from an actual site where the recording snowfall measurements and snow water equivalent at Mount Rose ski area. And you can see you've got da daily data for things like the amount of snow, the depth, the amount of water that's accumulated over the year. So these are really good resources to use for figuring out what precipitation might be like. And this is kind of what a snow tail site might look like. Um, on the left, you've got what's called a snow pillow. It measures the weight of the snow and also the depth. So it can tell you how much water is in your snow. And this kind of tower on the right is a rain gauge that'll just measure precipitation over the course of the year. Um, other data that might exist, like a stream gauge, the United States Geological Survey keeps a really good network of stream flow information. So this is from Lamoille Creek in the Ruby Mountains. You can see every day in the afternoon, the snow is melting right now, and then it's running off, reaching a peak, and then the stream flow goes down in the morning after it cools off, and then it melts. And so we've got basically 84 years, according to this site, of data for this stream. You can see there's the average flow for each day for these dates. And you know we can start to pull that data and figure out what precipitation might look like for a different basin. Here's another map that I found that's a snow, um, a snow accumulation map. It's another good data source. Um, and I'm not really sure how I'm going to use all of these data sources or look at them all or what sort of uh, analysis techniques I might use if I'm trying to actually look at individual basins or determine um, perennial yields yet. But just kind of brainstorming, and it's nice to know that, OK, I can look at these factors. Uh, the second factor I was looking at, soil and rock characteristics. This is really important. Uh, the questions I've been asking are things like, what type of soil exists? Is it, are there rocks? Uh, what is the infiltration rate? So when water falls on that soil, is it sinking into the groundwater, or is it just sitting there? Um, how much groundwater can those rocks store? Or is there a lot of space between you know, some sort of gravelly soil? Or is there is there space in that actual geology to hold water, or is it just a really hard, dense mass? And then are there features like playas in the valley, or is it all sagebrush and just sand? Or, you know, what kind of things is the geology actually doing with regards to that water? And finally, does it allow for water to be shared with other basins? And so, some of the data that might exist for the soil and rock characteristics, um, most of the United States has been really extensively mapped geologically. Um, this is the Independence Valley in Nevada. Uh, you can see this is a kind of a close up of what that geology might look like. And someone's even gone and sketched out what they think the subsurface of the earth looks like down to maybe several thousand feet in this. So you can pull up that data or there's, you know, here's a statewide geologic map of Nevada that I might pull in. Uh, these are hydrogeologic units. And a lot of this data has also been created in a um, electronic format. So you don't just have to look at some map and guess. You can pull it into GIS database and correlate that with something like precipitation and start to figure out the characteristics of your basin. Another characteristic that I was talking about is something called infiltration. Uh, and that is how easily does the water enter the ground? And so in this example on the left, this is a really bad place for infiltration. This is just hard, hard rock. And if you look at the river, it's all that water is just flowing downstream, right? Like pretty much no water is actually going into this rock. So there's no groundwater there. It's just hard granite and that will provide for flows. Uh, but on the right here, you can see, here's a stream that was in hard rock and then it's getting into a geologic unit that's really good for infiltration. This is the gravel. You see that water's just kind of disappearing underground. And what's happening is if you look at this really poor sketch that I have, um, you can see the lots of space in between the gravel for that water to just go into. Um, so it will really, really easily infiltrate water into the ground. And having those spaces will also, in turn, create an aquifer that can store water. So again, if you look at this gravel on the right, it's got really good storage. The water has space to sit between the actual particles of gravel and make a really good aquifer. Something like these playa surfaces, they're really, really fine clay particles. And so they're actually a really bad aquifer because all those particles are just jammed together and there's no space between them. And so a lot of times water can't even actually infiltrate in these clays. Um, 
And so it just pools on top and then you basically lose all of your water resource in the valley because it just evaporates. And, you know, there is some aquifer in these plaza surfaces, but they're going to be uh, hard to utilize for a number of reasons. So the third factor I'm thinking about is evapotranspiration or plant characteristics. Um, the questions I'm asking with regards to that is what plant species are in a basin, how much land is taken by crops and fields versus maybe forest or sagebrush? Um, what are the characteristics of these plant species? What do their roots look like? How do they use water and how quickly do they distribute water to the atmosphere again? And then some other questions that impact the way those plants use that or whether evaporation might happen. What is temperature and what does wind look like? Those are two of the most important factors in evaporation is both temperature and wind. And then have these factors been impacted by climate change or might they be? Well, I think you guys already know the answer to that. We're expected to see warmer temperatures with climate change. So for evaporation, then what are typical temperatures? Well, that question, of course, temperature is going to be impacted by climate change, right? So that's something we're going to have to think about and figure out how to model and plan for, again, using the data that exists. So, you know, for plant species, you might look at some vegetation data sets, uh, maps, satellite imagery, something called a greenness, greenness index, which sort of indicates how well those plants are doing based on their greenness. And it's actually a, a color sort of uh, color type imagery that will indicate how healthy those plants are based on how much water they can uptake. Um, some of the other characteristics, you know, we, we might need to actually go out in the field and look at some of these plant species or study them a little bit more because they haven't all necessarily been fully characterized. Um, as far as temperature and wind, uh, you know, like I said, evaporation is driven by temperature and wind predominantly and also humidity related factors. So we're going to have to look at, again, meteorological data, look at some of those weather data sets. And then, you know, I already talked about climate change. So we're going to have to figure out a way to model how climate change is going to impact all these factors if we want to plan for water resources 50 years in the future or 100 years in the future. So here's what we might do with a satellite image. This is the Reese River Valley. You can see, oh, here's these places that are being taken by crops. And then you know, what are these crops and what is their evaporation rate or transpiration rate, I should say. So we know that. And then if you look at the valley, you go, okay, there's some sort of area in the middle of the valley where vegetation is different than this right side of the valley. And then you get to the far east side of the valley over here on the far right of the picture and you go, hey, that looks like forest. And then, you know, all of a sudden we have a better understanding of what plants are in your groundwater basin. Uh, as far as plant characteristics, um, Coming back to sagebrush again, this is a, sage, a big sagebrush on the left. Check out that root. These things are somewhat considered a fratophyte, which means they use groundwater for a resource. But this root was in the side of a wash. I really liked it. It was about 30 feet long. And so again, here's sagebrush in the middle of this image. And that, that plant will really take groundwater. Some of these other plants, these grasses with the deeper roots, they might also take some groundwater or Maybe if you look at this sort of spread out pattern on these little bunch grasses, they might just soak up water rather than letting it infiltrate into the ground. So we need to think about these characteristics when we decide how much water is then going into the aquifer versus just being taken by these plants. Um, and so I just want to conclude my talk by talking a little bit about sagebrush, which is my favorite plant, um, Artemisia tridentata. It is a beautiful flowering plant, especially in the fall when it uh, causes a lot of people to have allergies. And they typically aren't that big. They're mostly range in size for about two to five or six feet. But some big sagebrush can get as tall as 12 to maybe 15 feet. Um, I've seen some specimens that are around like 12 or 13 feet and hoping one day I can find a 15 footer. Uh, this is me looking excited in a little sage forest a couple of years ago. These were all about 10 feet tall. And so sagebrush, I think, is a really good indicator of groundwater health and depth, and it can indicate changes to groundwater levels. And uh, again, I just want to say I haven't really studied this so much as I'm starting to think about how I might study this a little bit or how I might think about these scientific factors. Um, of course, you're, you know, here's your model of the sagebrush. It's going to be transpiring out of the top. Uh, it has sort of a shallow root structure which spreads out along the ground surface, and that easily allows it to easily collect rain and water that falls. But then, like I mentioned, it's got that really long tap root, which can sometimes grow as much as like 30 or 40 feet, and it'll tap into the aquifer and pull up that, that groundwater, which makes it a phreatophyte. And so 
when you get to a place that has groundwater that's relatively close to the surface, you'll sometimes get these sage forests that exist. Uh, this is one of the most impressive ones I found. It had just a full collection of sagebrush that are about 10 feet tall, 12 feet tall, just totally scattered around. That's me in the middle holding up a four foot long shovel for height measurement. Um, and these sagebrush here were located very close to a spring, so I know there's good groundwater. And they're obviously really healthy because they're pulling into that spring source that's underneath the surface and they're utilizing it. And for whatever reason, they don't have a lot of competition from other water loving plants in this particular environment. So they're able to grow really, really big. Um, and I also think that they can be a good indicator of groundwater depth and changes in groundwater levels. Uh, there's a number of valleys that I visited in the state where you got there and you see what appears to have previously been really healthy sagebrush, but now it just kind of seems really dry and dead. And so I've been asking myself this question, you know, why do you go out there and you see this ecosystem that was once flourishing and now it just looks like it's ready for a change in plant types and it's obviously not functioning the same. And so it could be related to uh, something like climate change, you know, maybe there's less uh, water that's evaporating and actually going into groundwater for use of the sagebrush, or maybe it could be related to decline in groundwater levels. Maybe, you know, what we're seeing like in this instance is you had healthy sagebrush, it's pulling groundwater, started to have some wells, it pulled down the groundwater a little bit, and maybe where you're getting your perennial yield is actually a loss in transpiration from the sage, and now the sage isn't pulling it anymore. I'm not sure. Um, these are questions that haven't really been studied or addressed very much, but uh, just something I'm thinking about scientifically, and you know, obviously I'd have to start going through the scientific process again to consider the data and what studies have been done and how we might be able to do that, but um, just considerations I have, you know, because I like to see healthy sagebrush, of course, across the state. And I also like for people to have an adequate amount of water to use when they need it. Um, anyways, guys, thank you all for your time. Um, I guess now is the opportunity for me to turn it over to questions if anyone has any. Wow, thank you, Will. That, that was fascinating. And it's gonna give me a whole new perspective of, what, of the uh, landscape when I drive across Nevada. Um, I love the adaption of the sagebrush that it can collect some surface water and also adapt to get groundwater. It's a fascinating evolution of the plant. Really cool. So Mary Kate Stewart has a question. Have there been any formal scientific papers or studies on using sagebrush as a mechanism for groundwater levels? Oh, that's a good question, Mary Kate. Um, you know, I haven't actually looked a lot into it myself as I've just sort of been formulating these theories. Uh, truthfully, in the last couple of weeks as I've been thinking more about how I was gonna make this presentation and some of the characteristics I've been seeing. Um, I know that there have been some studies over at the Nature Conservancy where they've been looking at groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, they call them GDEs and they've been looking at a bunch of different plant types that they consider to be groundwater dependent. Um, but speaking to Laurel Saito, the director about it, she, my impression was that they hadn't been considering sagebrush very much as a type of plant that goes into these groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, so I don't think there have been a lot of studies yet that have really looked at those sort of factors. Um, but this is an avenue that I am hoping to actually look into in the next couple of months myself as I've started thinking about it more. Oh, great. Um, I did, I've heard about aerial studies where they look at vegetation as a indicator. Graham has a question, has Nevada Division of Water Resources worked to reintroduce beavers in headwater streams to help increase groundwater recharge and stream flow? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And I wish I knew the answer to that. I believe the answer is no, because I think that's outside of the scope of the Division of Water Resources specifically. Um, we mostly deal more with uh, water rights and allocations of water and water accounting, whereas something like a beaver reintroduction program might be something that um, like the Forest Service might begin working on or something like the USGS might do a more formal scientific study to determine sort of the impacts and the benefits of that. But I know that that has been, that's a, um, I would say that's a topic and that's a, a technique that's been used in a few other places and has been shown to help with that, especially if there's a good recharge zone in those places where the beavers would typically build dams. And they are native, I'm assuming? They are native to parts of the state, but Nevada has really interesting sort of distribution of its um, 
fauna kind of because of you get these isolated pockets of mountains separated by a lot of really dry valleys. So they're not always native where you might think they would be. Hmm. Another one from Gavin, do wells drawing water for residents significantly contribute to the decline in groundwater in those basins? Um, so actually, uh, how do I say this? This is a question where the answer is both yes and no. Um, for most basins in the state of Nevada, the primary use is irrigation. Um, and so the residents who have those farms, yes, they're drawing water and declining the groundwater. Um, but as far as just like household use or something like that, that's typically not the main reason the water is being drawn down. Um, but other basins, like I was showing you guys that Pahrump Basin, the reason that basin has so much drawdown is because there's a lot of domestic water wells that are, yeah, all sort of pulling the groundwater together and drawing it down over time. Um, mm. And yeah, well, I, there's a lot of different issues related to it, but I guess the answer I would say is, is yes, ultimately. Pretty much any wells pulling water will contribute to the drawdown. Um, and if you consider residents to be farmers, people with homes, a city, you know, it's all of those are kind of, yes, I would say. Yeah, great. There was a lot of information. Thank you very much for sharing all that with us. And uh, I think we'll wrap it up unless you have anything la last to say. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, having me on here and giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, it's interesting to read the comments here. Graham says that agriculture uses upwards of 90% of total water consumption, which is correct. Um, wow. So yeah, that's, that's, that's why I say uh, using the term residence is kind of, I think the question comes down to, do you consider agriculture as a residential use? Well, maybe if the farmers are using it for their farm. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, that is a correct statistic. Uh, in Nevada, I think we've got about four and a half million acre feet of water that are considered overall the state's water resources. And of that resource, um, yeah, it's only about 500,000 acre feet that go to actual city uses versus agriculture. Great. Well, thank you, Will. We really appreciated you sharing that with us. And thank you to the Toscano Agency and uh, great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was awesome to be part of it. Yeah. All right, everybody. See you next week.